Hello everybody and welcome to this, the latest episode of the Rewatch Project with Hannah and Mike. I am Mike and with me, as always, is Hannah. How the heck are you this evening, Hannah? Well, that is correct. We have not pod faded. We are still here. We've life faded, but we, we have haven't pod faded. So Mike went to the UK, then came back with a gift with no receipt. A venereal disease. <laughs> <laughs> He came back with COVID, and he's only gone and passed it on to me. Yes. Um, he so, is now testing negative, and I am still a positive yeah. petunia. You are. That's what I call you. Positive petunia. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we we both are. We both have COVID. Um, so that is another reason why we haven't recorded for a while. But uh, under Hannah's urging, so you can thank uh, or blame Hannah, depending on how this goes. Um, that we are recording tonight. I was very much of the fact of, fuck it, why not? Yeah. You know, so sorry if that's a bit of a half-assed approach, but that's the approach I'm going for. Yeah, we'll see. And I, I think Twin Peaks might lend itself to being watched in a semi-fevered state. So, yeah, uh, we'll, yeah we'll be fine. We will see how that goes. Uh, but speaking of which, Hannah, uh, what episode of Twin Peaks are we covering this evening? Please well, tell just, us about it. I'm just making sure I've got the right one up. I have. Uh, Tonight's episode is called Cooper's Dreams. The synopsis says, Cooper and company have tea with the log lady who tells them there was a third man following Leo and Jacques the night Laura died. At Jacques Renault's cabin, Cooper, Hawk and Truman find Waldo the bird. And this is the sixth episode. episode. Cool. Um, It's directed by Leslie Linker Glatter. Yeah. And... Written by Mark Frost. Awesome, Leslie Lee Glatter, another another uh, indie filmmaker. A lot of female directors on Twin Peaks, which yes. I don't think was terribly usual at the time. Um, it does feel quite like. No, no, you tell me. You look like you were expecting me to answer. Uh, no, no, right. It's, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that Twin Peaks is quite a gender agnostic show mm. in many ways. Uh, I mean, a lot of people. Uh, do um, accuse Le- David Lynch sometimes of misogyny. Um, I think because he does a lot of films about women in trouble. But I, I mean, without getting you know kicking that rock over too much, I just don't think that David Lynch sees the world and art's place in the world the same way that the rest of us do. And I think I would caution people from trying to apply the rules, <laughs> yeah, in the same way to David Lynch that you would. Hell, even Mark Frost or Joss Whedon or Chris Carter or any of those people, I just don't think that he thinks of characters even really as people, as much as ciphers I, and I symbols. And I don't know if I agree with that as much, but I do agree in terms of people he collaborates, I don't think he sees gender. I think he sees their vision. There's, there's um, a famous quote from him. Or their skill and what they can bring out of what he's trying to tell. There's a great quote. I say quote. This isn't a direct quote. There's a great paraphrase of him when uh, Twin Peaks The Return came out in 2017 and somebody said to him, you know, hey, uh, lots of people on Twitter are talking about um, the treatment of women um, in The Return. What do you think about that? And he's just literally, he's like, I do not know what any of what you said means. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he literally, they may as well have just been speaking a different language yeah, yeah. That, uh, for him to be able to relate to. So I think that that's a, a bit of a tricky one. But uh, mm. but uh, cool, okay. Well, um, before we get into that, just a c- couple of little bits of housekeeping. Uh, reminder that we appreciate feedback at rewatchprojectpodcast at gmail.com or through the comment section on our YouTube channel. And also we are on Twitter and Instagram. In both cases, we are at rewatchproj. Please check out our friend shows, namely Chinsaroka vs. Punter, his film, Her Movie, Film Bastards, Video Game Landfill, The Good, The Bad, and The Odd, and the Talk Without Rhythm podcast. And also we really appreciate reviews on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your podcaster of choice is. Do we have any feedback? Adam? We do. Okay. Um, we have an email entitled Twin Peaks Rewatch. Okay. Hello, Mike and Hannah. Jackie from LA here. I am a new listener to your podcast, specifically your Twin Peaks episodes. I am loving watching the show again, and unbelievably, I have not watched it since it first aired. I remember being mesmerized by it, but have 
been a little scared to go back and watch it in case it did not stand up to my memory of it. I am very relieved to say it does. I am also relieved to hear you are covering the film and the sequel show, as I have seen neither, and it gives me an excuse to do so. Looking forward to Mike getting back so you and I can continue the rewatch. Hannah mentioned Babylon 5 in the last episode, and I have to ask, could that be your next rewatch? I really need to revisit that too. Keep up the great work, Jackie. And Jackie's from, from where? LA. LA. I, I first, I don't think I've ever had feedback on any podcast I've ever done from somebody from LA, so that might be a first. It, welcome, Jackie. Welcome, yes, welcome, Jackie. Yeah, so I mean, it's funny, I, I do see people who watch the original Twin Peaks and then never saw the film or the TV show, and, or, or who, or, and or have gone back to uh, watching it, you know, a little trepidatious wondering whether it's going to stand up or not. But what I will say is at least those people who are going back to it now have got like beautiful high definition versions of it to watch yeah. as opposed to the dog shit VHS <laughs> copies that we had for the longest time. Um, I, I've i only seen the, um, what are you going to call it, sequel, sequel show, Um once so so i thought you'd seen it more i Mm -hmm. thought you'd watched it again Mm -hmm. um so i'm interested in how much i've remembered and the bits that stick in my mind that i think about whenever someone says the third season of twin peaks these are the things that come up in my brain yeah like how much of a big part are they actually yeah. on rewatch? I always think when people mention the return, I always think of the, the the musical sequences in the Roadhouse at the end of the episodes. That's one of the things. Yeah, that my that's not to. for me. Um, I mean, I'm not going to talk about them here because not that it's a spoiler as such, but I'd I'd prefer to talk about it in the episode. Yeah. But it's a bit like um, when we covered Agents of Shield. Uh, in the third season, um, I remember talking about the portion of it when um, Simmons is on the other planet, um, you know, mm-hmm. with, and um, they're trying to rescue her, whatever. I like. I th- I think I remember saying in the episode the first time I watched that through, I remember that being for a much longer period of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so on rewatch, it, it? yeah, it was so, it was over and done with so quickly. Yeah. Um, and it will be interesting to see if that same thing happens. Well, the other thing as well is, is that when we watched The Return, we were doing a rewatch of the original series uh, before The Return, but we ran out of time. Yeah, uh, we misjudged it, and then as the series started, when we were about two thirds of the way through <coughs> the second season, but mm. with hindsight, now knowing what I know, having seen the return, it really should have been Fire Walk with me that we watched before watching the return, because yeah. that's the thing, that's the Twin Peaks that that it, it references the most. Yeah, and we'll probably do it in that order. Yeah, well, it's release time order. anyway. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, it it will be really interesting. Um, I'm I'm really pleased to hear from you, Jackie. Thank you for sending your email in. Cool. Um, Always good in to hear. In terms from of you. Babylon Five, oh, that's, yes. that's definitely on our list of rewatch projects. Yeah. Well, I always thought it was funny. I I um, when I was feeling ill the other day, um, I had a real hankering to watch some Babylon Five because it's a bit of a comfort show for me. Yeah. And. Um, I downloaded it and was about to start watching it, just sort of, you know. Um, but then I, when I was searching for it online, I saw that it's actually getting a Blu-ray release for the first time ever quite soon. Uh. So it'll be coming out in, like, for the first time ever in, like, beautiful quality. Right. Um, so I don't know. I, mean, I, I feel kind of like we're probably almost due for a Babylon 5 rewatch anyway. Yeah. Um, so maybe. Well, I mean, that, yeah, but that's... That has always been something we've said that we will do. Yeah, we've never rewatched it, have we? No. Um, I mean, we've started to, but then, you know, other things have got in the way. Um, yeah. I, I, it's definitely, it's on the list. Yeah. Definitely on the list, um, along with many other things. You know what else is on the list? Twin Peaks. <laughs> shall, we, uh, shall we hit pause watch this? All right, Mr. Cheese. Okay, so what's the episode, uh, Mrs. Cheese? What's it called? 
No, remember, I'm positive Petunia. Sorry. Um, the episode is called Cooper's Dreams. Cooper's Dreams. Okay, so we're going to hit pause. We're going to watch the episode, and I'm going to come back and tell you what our reactions to it are. So I'll speak to you shortly. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, and welcome to Film Bastards, a podcast where three friends, two of them married and two of them podcasting life partners, chat everything from new releases, trailers, news, and an eclectic mix of other film goodies. Oh, and many, many, many tangents. You can find them by searching your podcast provider, or check them out on Twitter and Instagram by searching Film Bastards. You never know, you might like it. And if you don't, well, we don't really give a f- and we are back. So we have just finished watching Cooper's Dreams, the sixth episode of Twin Peaks. Any initial thoughts, Hannah, before we break it on down? Break it down. Break it down. I thought it was interesting how they kind of set it up like the pilot, in a way, with the the noisy foreign group in the yeah, hotel yeah. Um, but it, obviously it's the middle of the night. Um, well, I almost feel, wonder if at one point, and this does kind of become a thing at a certain point, that the outsiders coming in for something at the hotel was designed to be part of the show. Yeah. Like you get later on, there's a, there's a <laughs> it's not really a spoiler because it's a silly little thing. There's like this convention of people, and it's never explained, but it's loads of people in naval... Um, uniforms, bouncing tennis balls, mm. and they've taken over the hotel. So it's almost as though it's part of the flavour of the show was this idea that they're going to, every few episodes, bring in this new group of odd people mm. for something at the hotel. I, I do like how it kind of gives a flavour of being sort of in a slightly off-kilter Groundhog Day. Yeah. The same things are happening, the same nefarious things are happening with different characters. Yeah. Um, and this whole idea... And that, of- that theme goes throughout, and like you obviously you don't see that at the start, but as it unfolds and you see that um, Leo Johnson and... Hank. The off-kilter Groundhog Day thing being like, you've got a different set of foreign, a, a different foreign group... Yeah. Um. In the hotel, there's still like dodgy dealings, untruths going on. So Audrey is the one going to be at the perfume counter rather than Laura. You've got Madeline living at the Palmer House, not Laura. Yeah. You've got Leo Johnson and Hank. You find out that there's a relationship there, and Leo has taken over from Hank. Much to Hank's disgust. You also see that there's an additional level of subterfuge in the whole Josie, Ben, Catherine. Yeah, thing as absolutely. Well. Seeing that that Josie, you know, there there are more villainous layers to her than yeah. than you first realise, and and she's not this naive, um, innocent Who character. Who can barely speak English? Yeah, doesn't know what shenanigans means. Exactly. She's she's playing the part herself. It just adds another layer to the onion of mystery, I suppose. And I mean, this this episode just, I suppose why, hopefully the episode doesn't sound like this, but when Mike first asked me what I thought of the episode, I found it very hard to put that into words, partly because my brain is mush. But also, um, it it's hard to sort of quantify those things initially. It sort of it feels like a familiar episode but not as well, also you're we're, it. we're moving into a phase in the show where the narrative is really starting to take hold so it's not like the episodes now don't have something that obviously defines them as an episode so you don't have like earlier episodes where it was the funeral episode mm. or the rock throwing in the woods episode yeah i mean i would say that for me the um I'll explain what this means in a moment, but the, the eye of the duck scene in this episode for me very much is the uh, into the night sequence mm. in the woods. It, it's a term I'll be using quite a bit moving forward, but it's, it's a David Lynch term. 
And have you ever heard the phrase eye of the duck, the eye of the duck scene? What, do you know what that means? Yes, but explain it. Okay. Um, I mean, basically what it is, is it's a sequence that exists at a point where it wouldn't make any sense if it existed anywhere else. So the, the, it comes from the idea that if you're doing a painting of a duck, if you get the eye in just the wrong place, the whole energy of the image is gone. Why it's a duck, I don't know, but that's the David. So, and he always says that everything that he does has an eye of the duck sequence, a sequence which, you know, you could say is the defining sequence or the sequence that makes it all kind of hang together. And it, it, I find that most things that David Lynch does and most episodes of Twin Peaks, even though not all of them are directly, you know, created by David Lynch, have an eye of the duck sequence. Mm. And I would say that, so for example, um, I would say that in the pilot episode, the the um, the eye of the duck sequence is, is, is probably the Sarah Palmer crying down the phone. So yeah. uh, I'd say that, you know, the... The funeral sequence was one. The rock throwing in the woods is another one. And I would say that in this episode, it's the, you know, it's the, the sequence where they're basically the whole run of scenes across um, them finding the log lady's cabin and them finding Leo's abandoned cabin. I was going to say that just when you were saying how the first episode is, you know, the death and then this one, you know, what episodes the funeral ones the rock throwing? Yeah. And that's know. not the case now, really. It's no, just, it's the next episode. And I was about to say um, that I had, um, I sort of thought that that didn't happen until further through. Mm. We are actually only two from the end of season one. Yeah. So I mean, it's a very short season. Yeah, yeah, but um, I sort of forget that. I think, I think there's. A lot more because there's a lot more in season two. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, yeah. I just, ex- I, I think I expected there to be the one thing that defines an episode. Uh, I think that's why it's beyond saying I really liked it and then breaking the episode down and looking at specific mm. moments. It's a difficult episode to, um, to reconcile critically in an, in a encapsulation because, um, a, we've both got COVID, and B, it, it, it does nothing to holistically define the episode. To be honest, I think for me personally, you can take as read that I enjoy all of the episodes. Yeah. Um, there's not there there are elements that I enjoy less than others, and there are some episodes that soar. Yeah, I think, um, but. But I think it should be taken as read that that I enjoy all of Twin Peaks. Unless you say otherwise. And, yeah. <laughs> so I think from here forward, I'm not going to be saying if I liked it or didn't like it. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm just going to go into what you liked about what it. What I liked what about worked. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, well, should, so should go, we do that? You go for it. In the, in the spirit of that. So we open up with the Icelanders waking Cooper up. And the, I think the other... You talk about the site, the cyclical nature of the show, and I think part of this is the idea comes from the idea of um, the soap opera. You know, mm. I've talked before about how uh, the soap opera as a storytelling mechanic resists closure. You know, it's like very few people, um, you know, remember how Dynasty or Dallas ended because it doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, it's just. And that's the thing with it's Twin Peaks. The process Peaks as well. rather than the end game. Yeah, is that you can finish watching Twin Peaks and just go back to the beginning. You know, it's not, there's no end. You know, I mean, no. I mean, I mean, te- I mean, technically, Twin Peaks has three endings, mm. um, but it really has none. You know, yeah. I mean, it's just a question of where you choose. I always think of the, the line from The Dark Knight, you know, is it, you know, is it better to die a hero or live long enough to become a villain? Mm. You know, and about how happy endings are just where you've chosen to stop telling the story. Because who's to say that when Snow White goes off with um, the prince, he doesn't turn out to be an abusive bastard. But the story has ended with them mm. going happily off to live after. happily ever after, yep. as far as we know. Mm. And I think that Twin Peaks is never 
going to end or have an ending. Well, it doesn't give you those bold final claims yeah. like, and everything was fine with this person from here on out. Um, you know, it 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 really does just give you a snapshot of where they are at the moment that you meet them. Yeah, and, and it's like um, another great example of that. Is, and it's, this has changed a lot now. It's like if you look at a show like Lost, a lot of people kicked off because they thought that the final episode of that show was disappointing. And it's like, well, that's because it should never have had an ending. That show mm. should have just – it would have been great if it had just got cancelled. Yeah. And you, you never found out, you know, and you preserved the mystery and the I purity mean, I, of that I mean, I never invested my time in it, so I don't feel that strongly about the oh, well, ending. I, mean, another, I, another, I have friends who have yeah, yeah. I are mean, furious about it. But, uh, but my view of that is, um, does you not liking the ending diminish the enjoyment you had of watching the show whilst it's on? Because that enjoyment still happened. Yeah, but I know. can understand, you know, having enjoyment with a view to having questions answered. And I know there are things that I watch and enjoy knowing that there's going to be a conclusion to to events. Yeah. And when that doesn't happen, that's wholly frustrating. I mean, another, another great example of that, a very current one for us, is The X-Files. Is that yeah. The X-Files is a show uh, and movies where, God, The X-Files has had about five endings. Mm. Uh, and the most recent ending is just the most recent ending. It's only the ending in the sense that they haven't made any more yet since then. Yeah. And there'll probably be another three endings. It's a question of why you watch stuff. Uh, but then again, it's with the X-Files, every episode has an ending. It's, yeah. had, it's had 300 endings. I, <laughs> I think as, as much as Twin Peaks has a lot of surreal elements that, you know, obviously more that are yet to come, um, in terms of alternative ways of looking at things. Yeah, genre. I think it's probably the most true to life in the sense that when one person leaves this earth, you know, passes away, whether it's naturally or by force, that someone takes their place and the same things happen yeah. in this and more experiences are there. It doesn't mean you don't remember those people, but life carries on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the world keeps turning. And also, the, and, and that's where I think theology comes from, this idea that there are larger forces as mm. well. You know, I yeah. think it, it, it's part of that. But it, Yeah, and it, 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 it does sort of talk to the – the equal parts of being significant and really insignificant, yeah. which sounds a bit deep well, for, no, a, you, for no, no, a Tuesday you, evening. But you but, do you see know. how death affects people's lives yeah. and all of these things. But, but it's interesting because going back to this, this circular thing, one of the things that you see is that the, the, the bit with the, at the beginning with the Icelanders is very reminiscent of the, the first one-hour episode where you see Cooper – hanging upside down, updating Diane. Yeah. Of course, this is a Diane call. Mm -hmm. I've realised that the the two things that I quote the most in my life are probably Twin Peaks and The Simpsons, where to the point where I quote them so often that I even forget that I'm quoting them. It's just become part What's of my the language. What's The Simpsons one? Uh, oh, the Sim there's hundreds in The Simpsons. Right. I can't even begin to I miss list them. all of them. Uh, Devil's Advocate, you know, there's mi millions, millions. But... The, the one that I have in this scene that I always think of is when Cooper's talking about how when you travel, you, you almost you lose com the ability to control one's environment. Yeah. You know, that that's something that I, I often think about. And he talks about to Diane about how um, he gives a little bit of history as well about working in New York and the earplugs and all that kind of stuff. But of course, the, as the audience, we haven't got, um, you know, a clue what's going on here. But we see... Audrey attempts to um, speak to him and he warns her that he's feeling a little bit on edge, but she talks about how she's got a job and she wants to help him. Um, but because he's on edge, because he hasn't slept, he sort of pushes her away and that will have consequence yeah. uh, as the show goes on. Um, I love the fact that they keep upping the ante of the ridiculousness of the food stuff with Jerry. Like you've had the baguettes... Um, 
We'll, 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 there's, there's a fun bit of business coming up soon with a pig-shaped piece of cheese. But then in this, we've got the uh, the giant leg of lamb that he just whacks down on his yeah, desk. Yeah, which like, does happen to be my leg of beef for the episode for a couple of reasons. Okay. Firstly, how far has he transported that with just some glad wrap around the main part and the bone exposed? Because there was no wrapping around that bone. Yeah, well, only from the room, presumably. But presumably... He was gifted it, wasn't he? He was gifted it. Was it frozen when it was given to him? Oh, I thought so. They probably kept it in the uh, Great Northern (coughs) kitchen, didn't they? Some explanation would have been good. (laughs) Where did he put it? Oh, this is Twin Peaks. You can't apply that logic to him. Where did he put it? But... um, he was it served at the at the party they had. <laughs> we get a lot of great crazy Leland in this episode. Like when he tries to return to work, I feel like that's me with COVID on a Zoom call. I'm fine. <laughs> I can do this. He he talks about how he needs to occupy his mind and he mm. wants to work, um, but you can see that just Ben just doesn't want to have to deal with it. It just it's just messy and chaotic. And, and in that sense. I feel extremely sorry for Leland because, you know, he is supposed to be his business partner. Like, well, I mean, I know he's the lawyer, but like he's supposed to be involved. Yeah. And he has like really been cast aside. Like your, your child has died. Um, we've all been to the funeral and now, as I was saying before, life goes on and, Oh, very sad, very sad. But we're just going to forget about all your problems. The other thing to remember, though, dastardly this, deeds to is be that It's on been with. five days. I know. You know, I mean, so it, it is insane of him to try and. It's really to insane. Work. You know, so and it's insane for them to have stopped caring. Yeah. Well, I mean, what I don't know. You can question whether Ben ever did, but the the I think one of the themes of this episode is. There are so many characters who are not being listened to. Yeah. Um, or who aren't being given time. Yeah. And are being pushed aside. Um, but we see um we see them searching Jacques Renault's apartment. Um, I love, I've always loved, I know you don't like this turning into a quote fest, but there's there's some delicious pieces of writing here. And it's worth mentioning that this episode is a solo Mark Frost effort. And in some ways, this is the most Mark Frost episode because what it does is it, it it complicates the plot, but also it tries to make sense of Lynchian weirdness. Like there's a whole bunch of moments in this where moments from dream sequences are kind of attempted to be given earthly explanations, mm. and that's such a Mark Frost thing. But Mark Frost is like also the red curtains, yeah, exactly, and-, um, and there's always music in the air, you know. And I think that one of the things that Mark Frost does really well, aside from just, you know, writing plot, is he's really good at writing memorable dialogue that fits the characters. Like, I love the bit where Cooper walks into his Jacques' apartment and he's talking to Truman, and he's like, oh, you didn't sleep well. And Cooper's like, no, there is a large group of insane men on my floor. <laughs> just always yeah. love the way he phrases that. They find Flesh World. And I like the I like I don't think I ever fully understood this plot element before, but I like the idea that they're because Flesh World isn't just a pornographic magazine, it's it's like a it's a rendezvous magazine, yeah. it's a swingers magazine, basically. Yeah. But what the magazine does is it's a third party. So to protect people, they write into the magazine and then the magazine will forward it on. So nobody has anybody's address, so it's yeah. safe. But when you think about it, that's absolutely the perfect mechanism to do dodgy business through. Yeah, of course. Because you're you're you've got no one central repository of information. But now Truman and Cooper have tapped into that line of communication. They can actually start to figure I mean, out what's going it's on. It's the old school um version of the dark net. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And um the um I love as well how much Cooper, we've talked about this before, how much Cooper enjoys people. Like when he's opening the magazine, he's like, let's see what's inside. He opens it up and you can see him staring. At, he's not even looking at the magazine. He's staring at Truman because he just wants to get his reaction and sort of enjoy mm. his reaction to it. Yeah. Um, 
we see Bobby and Shelley plotting against Leo, um, and Norma goes to talk to Ed about Hank as well. And it's funny because we've talked before about how, in some ways, Ed and, I mean, Norma, normal. You know, it's almost like yeah. she's the most, probably the most grounded character in the entire show. Yeah. Like, she's the most unaffected by the Twin Peaksiness of everything. She's just trying to get on with the life. And I don't think her character in any of the shows or the movies directly encounters any of the otherworldly weirdness of the show. Like, she just exists in the real world. Mm. And I kind of like that, the idea that you've got all this mad, you know, mythic folklore and stuff going on. And she just wants to run a business and be with the man she loves. Mm. She doesn't give a shit about no. any of this other stuff that's going no. on. No, she is, she is, yeah, she is unaffected by that. Shelley and Bobby... Honestly, for two people that are scared of Leo catching them together, they spend a lot of time shagging at her house. Yeah, well, it's the limited sets. And also they want to create a sense of drama as well. I know, they? but it's like, fuck's sake, people, I'm on edge the whole time you two are lounging around <laughs> in your fucking bathrooms. And it's funny as well, because every so often, Bobby will say, like, oh, I've got to get back to school. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're a high school kid. <laughs> yeah. It's like, because you forget. Yeah. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're whacking school. I just I just realised that I I would just really not be cut out for that life. Like, I I would be have broken out into stress eczema within about the first 15 minutes of having that kind of affair. It's too much work, isn't it? Way too much work. It's, uh, it's, it's. The life of the young. During the scene with Ed and Norma as well, I mean, Ed mentions, says to her, look, you know, um, Nadine's not well. Uh, and it's interesting as well because we've got no context. We've just seen Nadine as this kind of kooky, crazy person yeah. for the run of the whole show. But clearly within the logic of the show, she's taken a turn. Yeah. And I like the way that Norma plays it. She's just like, well, well, you know, fuck. We we when are we ever going to take something for ourselves? Yeah, you know, we we're, we're so noble. Well, no, she she's pissed off because she knows that she couldn't do that either. Yeah. She's pissed off with herself as well. She, yeah, she she's she's it. as bad as he is when she's yeah. taken back. But she's just frustrated about the fact that she knows her own personality and and Ed's enough to know that they're never going to leave anyone in the lurch. Yeah, it's just not. The way they work. Yeah, they're, they're stuck in a kind of endless cycle as well, aren't they? Yeah. One little geeky note as well I've noticed is it's one of the few times we actually get an exterior shot of Horn's department store. And I'm wondering, I, I don't think they actually filmed that in Twin Peaks because it's not in the pilot. But mm. I've never noticed that before. This is just one of those HD revealing it. And um, we see Audrey in with Emery Battis, one of the, man the manager of the perfume counter. Mm-hmm. Of a department store. And it's interesting as well. Emery Battis was a actor, 1930s screen actor. So it's interesting that they chose to name the character after that. There was a lot of that in the 90s. Mm. Like Max Schreck, one of the characters in Batman Returns, was named after a, the silent movie actor who played Nosferatu. Uh, it seemed to be a kind of um, a, 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 um, an in vogue thing to do at the time. And, uh, and basically... Nosferatu is a pretty uh, cool name. Sorry? Nosferatu. <laughs> um, and we see um, Audrey basically shows how manipulative she is by blackmailing Battis into getting her a job there. Mm -hmm. We see James and Donna at the lake, and oh, nobody understands James's pain. Uh, I bet he'd be oh, terrible to have COVID with, wouldn't he? Oh, fuck. He can't be any worse than you. So, so he talks about his mum. You really want me to spoon you in front of a window, don't you? <laughs> While you tell me how hard your life is. No, no, on a gazebo, is. Hannah. Um, how hard your life is. Yeah, I, I feel your pain. Um, so he tells her about um, his dad who ran off and his mum who's a writer and alcoholic. And we see the... And this is interesting because when Cooper and Truman are looking at the magazine, they talk about the... Um, Cooper says that must be the place because he's got red drapes because of the dream. Mm. And... You know, and uh, like I mentioned earlier on, along with um, sometimes my arms bend back, back, it's this literal thing. And I think it's interesting because at this point... <laughs> See where your mind is, bap. <laughs> and the, uh, <laughs> but, but I think that at this point in the series, what Mark Frost is suggesting is the only reason we saw red drapes in Cooper's dream 
were they were a clue for this. Yeah. Spoiler alert, there's more to it than that when yeah, the show moves forward. Is. But I think at this point in the show, that was probably the case. Mm. It was the fact that everything in that dream was just meant to symbolise something and Cooper yeah. just had to unlock the symbolism mm. and make it literal. And I think that part of the way, the intuitive way that David Lynch and Mark Frost work, the whole idea of ideas appearing from the subconscious and us decoding and finding meaning in them, is what the show's about. Mm. You know, I don't think you can apply the logic of, oh, well, they just retconned it or they... I I just don't think you can think of it like that. Mm. But it is interesting at this point in the show, seeing that the approach that they've taken to the Red Room is that it's just this symbolically loaded moment that gives clues to things that are going to happen in the show and how literally Mm. the show is taking it as just being that, yeah, as being... This is just Cooper tapping into, using Tibetan method to tap into the collective unconsciousness or collective consciousness, and that's what's happening. Mm. And again, you know, there's, there's always music in the air later on we see as well. It's one of the few times as well in the diner where we actually see music playing in the diner that's realistic to what would be playing in the diner. And it's not like fucking 100 megawatt loud. Yeah, it's not know. weird jazz. It's like... Kind of fiddle country music. And it's literally just humming along in the background. So Maddie meets with Donna and James. And I love how much they play this scene, like the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, right down to the fact that everything's very earnest and like Maddie's like, oh, it sounds like a secret. And she wants to drink. Cherry Coke, please. Cherry Coke, you know. It's the worst of all the drinks. Yeah, I mean, it reads like a kind of 1950s, you know, young adult kind of team that, book. That's my second leg of beef. She doesn't even take a sip of it. Oh, that's a common thread in Twin Peaks. There's lots of untouched drinks. Yeah, it's really annoying. <laughs> Don't order anything if you're not going to stay for a drink. I love that Shelley and Norma's day of beauty involves getting beehive. <laughs> <laughs> Shelley especially looks fucking terrible. Yeah, yeah. It always feels like they should have like those, you know, the fish bowls in them. And... Like Norma's here. She looks lovely. Well, it looks age specific, doesn't it? Well, no, but her her sort of beehive and French roll isn't quite as mad as Shelley. Oh, okay. So you're actually just judging the quality of the hairmanship. Well, Shelley, Shelley's obviously got a lot of thick, curly hair, and they've put it up and so that the two of them have got similar styles and it really just doesn't fucking suit her hair. What they should have done is had a male friend go with them and he should have had it done as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like in when Harry met Sally, um, when Carrie Fisher gets married and you're supposed to think that she looks amazing and she looks fucking terrible. <laughs> her, her wedding dress is just awful. Um, but, you know, Sally's busy crying about how amazing she looks and you're like, she looks yeah. like a fucking... Try your eyes. Bag lady. <laughs> also, Hank's a slurper, I noticed. Yeah. I I would have been in jail for murdering him. Yeah. Uh, we see the Briggs family therapy as well. Uh, we learn that uh, Laura wanted to die. And, and what is interesting is that what Jacoby gets through to with Bobby, you know, and Bobby's got this whole, you know, the big bad Bobcat and all that. But basically yeah. what you see is that he's just a boy. Yeah. Ultimately. Uh, and he's just fronting. Standing um, in front of a girl. <laughs> and yeah, with a beehive. <laughs> and, um, Asking he's, he's, to love him and he, with a they, gun. They, they talk about how Laura had a horrible secret that made her prey on people's weaknesses and corrupt them because she felt corrupted. So what, what the suggestion is here, um, and this is kind of the modern sensibility to saying this, but here is that there's clearly a cycle of abuse yeah. going on here. What they're describing is very much... Um, somebody um, issuing uh, torment onto somebody because they've been receiving it, yeah. you know. Um, and she made him sell drugs at school. Uh, again, I don't know why it would be cocaine because... In a way, it's kind of like, I feel terrible, so everyone around me must feel just as terrible. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, um, well, and also because she said that every time she tried to be good she'd get pulled further down into the darkness. So I think her logic seems to be, well, then I'll just, I'll just go dark. Just go dark. Just embrace yeah. it, you know? Mm. Um, we see um, the 
um, Hawk, uh, Cooper, Truman, and poor Doc Hayward, who's dragged along for some bizarre reason. <laughs> I know, um, with his great big stick. His stick, uh, going into the woods. I um, would like that stick. And it's funny, because we get a little bit more of the slightly racially insensitive Hawk the Tracker, you know. <laughs> Um, with, the, with the bent stick. Yeah, things. exactly. He's like, oh, they're, they're coming this way. And um, I'd be terrible, like, in, uh, in, <laughs> in that situation. No, like, let's be honest, you'd be lost. Somebody could you'd have trodden... probably have no pants on. Yeah. Hypothermia. They could have trodden in paint <laughs> and walked through. A bag of Asian scroggin in your hand. <laughs> no. um, crying because you missed your mother. Oh, hey. Um... <laughs> So we see the log lady, or Margaret, uh, as they call her. And the thing is, although I mentioned the whole thing about Hawk, what I like is that it feels like in Twin Peaks, we talked about this before, this idea of modernity and nature and culture and savagery and tribalism and all that kind of stuff Mm. um, and ancient knowledge. You get the feeling that Hawk and... Margaret kind of understand each other. Yeah. Like that they are privy to some primal understanding. Yeah. And it, and you can be reductive and say that that's a Native American thing, but I think it's larger than that and, and more general than that. Like they talk about how um, Margaret's husband, basically the suggestion is that he died on in a fire on their wedding night. Mm. Uh, and she refers to fire um the devil is fire hiding like a coward in the smoke mm. uh, and she talks a lot about the owls the owls can't see us in here as well yeah. and you see cooper kind of being a bit of a city slicker like he 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 goes to eat before he's given permission and um she he gets reprimanded and each time you see hawk kind of smoothing it over and going of you know you heard something, didn't you, Margaret? And you get the feeling that they know each other. That's the one thing I would have to say I found out of character for Cooper because he, you know, he's into the Tibetan rock throwing practices and believing the dreams that come to him from, you know, the lodge and yeah. all this kind of thing. The fact that he, almost can't suspend his disbelief when it comes to the log lady. But Cooper is still a modern person. Yeah. He's got the dictaphone, yes. he's got... But, yeah, but I I think, given how open he is to so many things, it's interesting that he is quite closed off to her to begin with. And you see it in an earlier episode as well, like it's, when she says she asks him to speak to a log and yeah. he can't... So it's like as though, it's a it's as though Cooper's like, hey, even I have like yeah, and like I I think that is a failing of of the the character yeah because you know he should be open to that he's open to everything else they should there there shouldn't be that ambiguity there with her yeah um I I do think that's a failing of the writing there. I, I disagree. I, I think that shows shading with the character because there are a lot of things that Cooper is cynical about and you see it more as the show goes on. And part of it is that there is there's a suggestion that there's a little bit of hubris with Cooper as well because if you look at the Tibetan thing... Hubris. The, the, if you look at the Tibetan thing, that was a very kind of fashionable, new agey thing at the time. Yeah. Um, so I... I get the feeling that there's a suggestion that Cooper is open to these things, but within his own little realm. It's a little bit like when you hear Catholics say that Scientologists are crazy because they believe in this alien guy, and it's like, well, you believe in like this super Jesus person, you know? <laughs> so, super Jesus. <laughs> so, so it, it's. I, I don't think that's a failure in the writing. I think that's a choice, right? With, with um, the character. And I think it's something that you see more of as the show goes on. And it is shown as being something that kind of undoes Cooper a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, maybe point point some of those out to me as well, yeah, we well, get well, further well, in. Because, because space. to me, it kind of, I would have to say that's the one thing that I haven't set, that hasn't sat well with me. Yeah. And I think part of it is. Not like, and I say that in a, it's not terrible. It's just. I guess it's the only time 
that I've felt pulled out of the writing. Yeah, but I just think that it's that Cooper's openness to spirituality comes from a very modern New Age place, mm. whereas Hawks and Margaret's comes from something old. And the... I think there is a division there. Like you even see uh, after after Laura's funeral when Cooper and Hawk are having that conversation and Hawk's talking about the dream soul mm. and Cooper's just like hearing all this for the first time and kind of wide-eyed about it mm. because um, that's not part of his... Um, yeah, but even then, like he's wide-eyed when it comes to Hawk, but he's disbelieving when no, it comes but, to No, but ultimately he does... Go with it. He does ask for Log. Yeah, because Hawk has kind of given it his seal of approval. Mm. It's almost like he doesn't. He thinks the Log Lady's the fucking crazy. But girl. I don't think necessarily that Hawk believes in the Log. It's like you see, like you can, like Truman looks bemused, and Truman Truman obviously knows about the Log Lady, but and he's even more cynical than Cooper about all of the the Cooper stuff. So I think I get the feeling with the log lady is that nobody, even I think Hawk, certainly not Truman, believed that her log I think they believed that she saw something or heard something on the night. And if and Hawk knows her well enough to know that they have to play her game. And if they want to hear what she heard, then they have to hear quotes doing air quotes now for the listeners, what the log heard. Mm. In in the same way that like she's like a child. Like, it, you know how when a child has a tea party and they're like, no, you've got the wrong cup, and they ha they kind of lord over it? Mm. That's what that scene feels like. She is filmed like a child mm. whole, running a tea party, and she's got all these rules, mm. and, you know, she slaps Cooper's hand, and it's like they're all kind of nicely tolerating her to get mm. to the information that she's got. Of course, we as the audience are wondering whether there's any logic to this, but I don't think there's anything in the scene if by the end of it to show that anybody there actually believes that her log saw something. I think that maybe they believe that she was driven insane by the death of her husband mm. and has replaced him with a piece of wood and that they've got to kind of feed into that psychosis to get the actual useful information that she's got. I think that could be it. But I don't know. I just think there's a lot going on in that scene. And I think that the, the, the figure of the log lady is an interesting one because she's never unambiguously done. But without spoiling anything, I like that the third season, Twin Peaks The Return, goes back to the relationship between Hawk and her. Yes. Um, and that's nicely done. It's that's, really well but that's, done. Yeah. Mm. Future as his uh, problem. So um, she was expecting them. They have tea first, and this is where I've got a note about she's like a kid controlling a tea party, and uh, uh, the day after the wedding, you know, fires the devil hiding like a coward in the smoke. She says that there were two men and two girls, and then there was a third man, and that she, she again, references to the owls. We hear Into the Night by Julie Cruz playing um, in the woods, and it leads into the cabin where there's always music in the air, and they find Waldo and some blood. And some of uh, Finley's fine twine as well. And, and the poker the, chip. And the poker chip yep. with the piece missing. So lots of the iconography of Twin Peaks all in one place. Go to the Icelandic party. Um, I love the way that Catherine Martell announces herself as Catherine Martell and spouse. Yeah. When she's got the weather. And I, I, I've always loved the way that when Pete says to go, you know, go easy on the sauce, she immediately downs two glasses of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> and then just wanders, you know, wanders on. And causes a scene as well. And I've got to say, one of the things I'm really noticing on this rewatch is how good Richard Beamer is as Ben Horn. Yeah. The amount of just funny little bits of business he does with his face. Yeah. And you can tell he's a classic Hollywood actor. He just knows how to work with the camera. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, in a way that I think only people from that sort of era uh, uh, would, or as no, especially from that era would. Her dancing with, or oh, I'm rushing ahead, the slaps. Yeah, yeah, which look gives. they look real as well. She, I I love those slaps, and I love the fact that that Ben has absolutely no reaction to yeah, it. Yeah, like, he's used to it. But it, like, there's not even any pain registering. Yeah. And you get the impression with Ben Hall, 
is that he doesn't even care about the outcome. Outcome. He just lives for the subterfuge. Yeah. He just loves the game. Yeah. And he I, is a chaos merchant. And I love the way when Audrey's watching them and all that, and, and they have the big kiss. And I love the way at the very end of the scene, he's just like, breath mint. <laughs> it's like <laughs> charming. Yeah. And, um, and when, um, when they return to the party and he tells Catherine to go and dance with, what's his face? Leland. Leland. Oh, my God. Like, her dancing when she's tapping her head when he's, like, losing his yeah. mind. That's what I remember. It's one of those things that I always think about when it, if someone mentions Twin Peaks, I think of her tapping her head, dancing around the, the floor and making everyone else start tapping their head as well. It's it's like one of those lasting memories for <laughs> it's me. It's a cool memory. It's funny yeah. as well because it's like it's a classic Twin Peaks chaos scene mm. in the way that you've got Leland losing it. You've like got the, legitimately losing you, you, you've shit. You've got like the humour of the misunderstanding around the dance and then you've got the kind of the dichotomy of Audrey crying. You've got all of this stuff yeah. that just doesn't belong together. Yeah. Kind of like – and, and certainly didn't belong together on television. Yeah. You know, where – one of the things about TV, so well done. particularly back then, is you knew how you were meant to feel. You know, the music, the performance, you know, the laugh track on some shows would mm. literally be telling you, this is how you are supposed this to feel about this. This is you should be happy and, and, and this is, uh, I mean, to use a 21st century term, this show is very disruptive mm. in the sense that it's kind of uh, deliberately trying to disorient you about how you're supposed to feel. I also love that Pete's drinking a pint of milk. Yeah. When they're there. Um, so we see Maddie sneak a phone call, and this is what you, we did back before we had, uh, you know, instant she messenger. She's the worst sneaker emails. in the world. Sorry? Why would you turn the light on? <laughs> and we hear a bit of noise and a bit of confusion. There's always just this sense of what a horrible place the Palmer house would yeah, be to be staying. Just staying what a there. sort of house of nightmares, that is. And um, the... She talks about the bedpost and the tape. Uh, ben sees Josie, um, and Ben seems to have double-crossed Catherine and has told Josie where the extra ledger was hidden. Yeah. We see Hank batter Leo as well. What This thing that we were talking about earlier on, this idea that there's just layer upon layer of, of power and subterfuge and lies and mystery, as we're seeing in the stuff with Josie and the stuff with Hank. But also... There are so many, and this happens in Fire Walk with me and in Twin Peaks Season 3 as well, there are so many, quote, tough guy characters who we only believe are tough guys because we're told they are. Yeah. Because Leo and Hank just don't look like tough guys. No, well, one sucks a domino. Well, Leo looks like... the worst ponytail of all time. The bass player in a hair metal band. (laughs) And Hank just looks like a friend of my dad's when I was growing up or something, you know. And... But when you accept it, you're like, okay, Leo's a real badass. And, oh, Hank's an even bigger badass because he beat that badass up. And it's just, you just he kind of go with it. He domino and speaks yeah. in a kind of yeah. menacing way. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I mean, you know, you don't do that and you're not a badass. Still looking for a slinky. Yeah, yeah. So we see Leo go in and kick off at Shelley and she shoots him. I love that his reaction is anger. Yeah. He's like, ah! Oh. It's like, God, actually, okay. You're selling it now, you know, for a hair metal bass player. We see the singing start up again in the hotel, just as you see Cooper sort of tip to me, like, oh, I've got away with it. And then he's like, oh, God, no, they started up again. Mm-hmm. And um, he walks into his room and sees that Audrey is there, still upset. After... Well, he sees that his room is unlocked. And yes, he thinks yes. someone's broken yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, and he says, turn the light on. Yeah. And uh, he's left with a uh, sexual dilemma. Yeah. And... Then we close. So any final thoughts, Hannah, before we wrap up for the evening and um, hopefully um, move on to our COVID-free lives? There is so much good stuff to come. I'm just very keen to pick up the pace somewhat. Yeah, that episode flew by, didn't it? Yeah, I I feel like we need to record another one fairly swiftly. Yeah. Um, Hey, let's just concentrate on getting this one out first because that hasn't happened yet. But. I don't think we should wait for any length of time for feedback and things. I think maybe we'll just record the next one when we're ready. Okay. Because, you know, the good thing about Twin Peaks is when you get in a momentum with it, it only enhances it. So I just I just want to get on that crazy train. Yeah, it's it kind of, it, I think because Twin Peaks is such a dream, 
it kind of it breaks the spell a little bit if you go too long. I yeah. think without you, it's good to stay in that kind of bubble. Yeah, absolutely. a little bit. But uh, okay, well, um, whilst you look up the details for the next episode, I will just do a quick bit of housekeeping, namely uh, to tell you or to request. No, it's actually screw it to tell you to send us feedback at rewatchprojectpodcast.com. Yeah. Get on it, people. Uh, on. And comments on YouTube are also appreciated and will be read out as feedback if it feels appropriate to do so. And you can also reach out to us on Instagram and Twitter, where in both cases we are at rewatchproj. Reviews, preferably five-star on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and your podcaster of choice are also greatly appreciated, as is the checking out of our friend shows as well. So do that. And what are we talking about next time, Hannah? Uh, the next episode is called Realisation Time. Audrey cons her way into working at the perfume counter where Laura worked and discovers that it's being used as a recruitment post for One-Eyed Jacks. James, Donna and Maddie plan to lure Jacoby away from his office. It is directed by Caleb Deschanel and written by... By Harley Payton. All righty, looking forward to that. And that is us for now, and we will speak to you soon. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.